I'm going to need the microphone, I think. Um, my name's Diane Coyle. I'm an economist now at Manchester University. I've done lots of jobs in my career. I started out at the Treasury as an economist. I've worked in lots of public service roles. And I spent 13 years as a journalist writing about economic statistics. So I've seen it from a number of different angles. The most recent was writing a little book called A Brief But Affectionate History of GDP, which is why I think I got fingered to come and talk to you this evening. Now, in, the, uh, in 2015, the UK had a, gen a general election, and at the start of the campaign, on the first day, the figures for the fourth quarter GDP growth were published by the Office for National Statistics. And so the newspapers obviously interpreted that in the light of the election campaign. The headline in the Daily Telegraph, right-leaning paper supporting the Conservatives who were part of the outgoing coalition, the UK economy grew at the fastest rate for nine years in 2014, was the headline. And The Guardian, left-leaning, supporting the challenging Labour Party, living standards key to election as data sh show slowest recovery since the 1920s. So obviously any number which ought to be a fact and has the um, imprimatur of the Office of National Statistics and aired as, the, as a, an official statistic it's a fact. How can it be subject to such different interpretations? What makes this even um, odder is that the figure was 0.4%. And this is typical for quarterly GDP growth figures in the developed economies. They might be minus 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or 0.5, that, that sort of order of magnitude. And the margin of error on these figures is probably bigger than the figure itself. Now, the Bank of England, which is, produces one of the most closely scrutinized forecasts of UK GDP growth, is one of the only organizations to project that uncertainty backwards. How much uh, margin of error is there around the historical GDP numbers? And for the past year or so, if you look at their, uh, their database, they say there's a 90% chance that growth was somewhere between 1% and 4% a year. Okay, so that's the difference between um, incomes taking 70 years to double and 18 years to double. So this is a huge difference. That's the range of uncertainty about how well the economy has been doing in the recent past. And it's funny, we have this discourse about the GDP growth figures as if they are a real thing. But the message is, there is no real thing out there to be measured. It's uh, um, constructed out of all kinds of different statistics. There are uh, judgments made about the definitions, standardized internationally, so people use broadly the same definitions, but highly judgmental. Now, as Mike was saying in his introduction, the current conception we have of the economy and GDP dates back to the Second World War. And like all previous conceptions of how the economy should be understood, um, it was defined by the needs of the state but also by economic theory and economists. The um, GDP we have today was the outcome of a debate between Simon Kuznets, often called the father of GDP because of the uh, basic work he did on collecting statistics, and uh, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes was responsible for working out how to finance the war effort in the UK, and also had his brand new shiny theory, which um, was being taken up by economists and universities in the Anglosphere uh, initially. And the debate was, should we try to define a measure of economic welfare, or should we define a measure of economic activity that will fit Keynesian theory and allow the war effort to be fought so we know uh, how much that is available for war production, what sacrifice consumers have to make to enable that to happen. Kuznets argued for the economic welfare concept and he wanted to exclude things that were um, either unpleasant or just regrettable necessities that were needed to run a modern economy. So something like paying for the police to fight crime or advertising, he thought, reduced welfare and ought to be excluded from GDP. But wartime needs and uh, Keynes's alliances meant that he lost that debate, and so we ended up with GDP that measures economic activity. But for the period during the 1940s and for about 10 years afterwards, there was quite a debate among economists about the judgments that were made, including some critiques that have continued ever since, um, particularly what should we do about activity in the home? Um, 
housewives working, but also in developing countries, home production of food and clothes. And uh, the compromises made then, which are to measure things that are made at home because they can be taken to market and sold, or to have some estimate of them, but to exclude services in the home like cooking and cleaning and childcare, as it happens mainly done by women, um, that definition has stuck with us ever since. There was another turn that came about a decade later in the late 1950s and early 1960s um, with the Cold War. And Khrushchev made a famous speech about using industrial growth as the battering ram with which he would defeat capitalism. And Kennedy's uh, Council of Economic Advisers began then to talk about growth targets because Keynes cared about the level of incomes and employment, not, the, not growth. So the focus switched to growth for political reasons, but also because Robert Solo, at around the same time, published his famous model of economic growth. So there was an economic theory framework for looking at GDP growth figures as well. And then until, oh, probably the late 1960s or early 70s, economic students were taught national income accounting. How did this framework of understanding that incomes and output and expenditure in the economy should all add to the same total and what their components were and how that fitted together um, was taught to, to economic students and then dropped out of the syllabus. So none of it's taught now. As a matter of interest, does anybody know what the number is, what the level of GDP is? And you know, if you ask economic students the same question, they don't know either, so don't feel too bad about it. Um, so it's dropped off the curriculum. Economists don't think very much about the data that they use. You can just download it from the internet now and shove it into your program to do your regressions. And for a long period, although there have always been critiques of GDP, particularly from environmentalists dating back at least to the Club of Rome and also to feminist campaigners, they've been a sort of minority note in the debate. Now that's all changing. It might date back to the financial crisis when people thought gosh, this economy business isn't working out all that well for us. And around the same time, 2009, uh, President Sarkozy of France set up a commission uh, with Sen, Stiglitz and Fitoussi, and their report was quite prominent and set off a debate in the international organisations, including the commission, about going beyond GDP. What else might you think of? Because they recommended a dashboard of measures not only GDP, but the kind of welfare measures that uh, Kuznets and other critics had talked about. There have also been a lot of books. Now, uh, mine came out in 2014. It's called GDP, A Brief But Affectionate History. If you want to know something about GDP but not too much, I highly recommend it because it's 180 pages long and has some jokes. And a lot of others are more boring. Um, but since 2014, there have been at least half a dozen books published, popular books meant for the general public about GDP. And a couple of them uh, are just out now. It's not just in the Anglosphere either. Um, I was a bit unwell and I sat on the sofa reading detective novels, including uh, some about Chief Inspector Chen of the Shanghai Police Force. And one of them was about uh, pollution, a factory that was polluting a lake and there was a murder committed and so on, as happens in detective novels. And he wrote a report back to his superior in Beijing. To some extent, it's affecting the core of China's development with GDP-centered growth coming at the expense of the environment. It can't carry on like this, comrade Secretary Zhao. This isn't a detective novel. What is going on? Um, so there's something changing. And another big driver of change is the digital sector. Some of the things that are happening in digital are raising in a new disguise some of the original debates about what to leave in and what to take out of GDP. It's called the production boundary by economists. And I said earlier, home production got left out on the whole. But a lot of things that are done digitally, creating free software like R, creating all those fascinating free blogs that you can read and entertain yourself with, Wikipedia, also, things like the sharing economy, where you can spend a few hours a week driving a car or um, putting a, your spare room on Airbnb, that's starting to raise questions about, well, is that production boundary in the right place? And actually, is it really right that we include prostitution in GDP because there's a market for it and there's a price, although I don't know how the ONS collect the figures, I have to say, um, but excluding childcare in the home, that seems absolutely absurd. There's also a debate about innovation, and the digital sector absolutely insists that GDP growth figures are not reflecting what they know to be going on 
thanks to innovation in the digital sector. And one of the things that they might um, be actually referring to is this concept of consumer surplus, which is all the gains consumers get from new innovations that are not reflected in the price because we've got competitive markets that fix the price so the benefit goes to consumers in an unpriced way. So there might be a lot of that and the GDP figures might be accurate, but we just don't know. There's a big debate between an economist called Robert Gordon who says innovation is so over, it all happened in 1920 and a Silicon Valley. And there's also the big data revolution, lots more data sources to look at and what they might tell us about the economy. So all of that is going on and I think there's more chance of changing the way we conceive of and measure the economy than any time since the Second World War, but, but it's a huge coordination problem. In principle, all the countries in the world now signed up to collecting GDP figures and national accounts in accordance with internationally agreed standards. It takes about 20 years to change them, slow process. So many, many countries and agencies would have to get together to agree a change. And if you talk to journalists who report about economics, they know that that business about saying, oh, it's up 0.4%, the world has ended or not, they know it's nonsense. But they have um, a pattern of holding, they have a responsibility to hold politicians to account. And it's very hard to be the only person who's saying, I don't care about the GDP figures this time, I'll ignore that news. And if you ignore it and it's in the other newspapers, your editor comes to you and says, you missed a story, what are you up to? Similarly, the politicians, on the whole, know it's pretty stupid. But if they say, we'll measure something else, then the journalists will say, well, you're doing that because you can't increase growth and you're a failure at running the economy. So they're trapped in this deadly embrace with each other about what they talk, what they talk about when they talk about the economy. Worst of all, I think, we still lack a very compelling theory about how to think about the economy as a whole. I started out by saying there is no such thing as the economy out there to, to, be, to measure. It's not like a scientific measurement where there's a, a physical reality and you can try to improve the accuracy of the measure. So finding that compelling theory may well be the focal point around which people could coordinate and move on to um, changing the way we have of measuring the economy. I think it will happen, but I think it will take a long time. I have um, a facsimile of the, 19, the 1885 Yearbook of Statistics, Annual Abstract of Statistics for the United Kingdom, published by the Office for National Statistics or its predecessor uh, as a centenary edition. 1885, Industrial Revolution, Factories Everywhere, Charles Dickens, all of that stuff. And it's full of pages of detail about agricultural exports and the prices of different crops in market towns around England. And it's got 10 pages on the Industrial Revolution out of the 120. So those statistics were equally failing to capture the reality. I'm getting the eye from Tiago, I've got to stop talking. So I think we will get there. I think the reality is changing. I think our way of conceiving and measuring it will change, but I think it will take a long time. Thank you. <laughs>